Good morning again, everyone. And uh, I am Manisha Mishra. I am the program director at Alabama Possible. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Barriers to Prosperity Data Sheet webinar. This webinar will enhance your understanding of Alabama Possible's data sheet and will provide key findings from this year's edition of the resource. You will also hear from panelists with varied perspectives regarding how they use the data sheet. Please note that this data sheet does not include the impact of COVID since some of our data sources latest numbers are from 2019. Next slide, please. Housekeeping, um, as you can see, this webinar will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. And you can submit your questions using the chat feature throughout the webinar. Please mute yourself so there is no feedback when our panelists, when our presenters are speaking. So this is, a, we are a present on social media and active. Um, our, um, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. Please follow us. Now I would like to invite our data and res research manager, May Whiting, AKA our data ninja, to give us an overview of the data sheet. May. Awesome, thank you, Manisha. Hi, everyone, and thanks again for joining us today. I'm really excited to be with you to discuss Alabama Possible um, 2021 edition of the Barriers to Prosperity Data Resources. Like Manisha said, my name's Mae Whiting. I'm the Data and Research Manager. I just want to provide a little bit of context before we jump into all of the resources. This annual data project is very dear to our organization. We're especially thrilled to see the way that the project has grown and evolved over the last decade. And it has been really encouraging to see the way that these resources have been used in so many different capacities all across the state, especially over the last few years. So in just a moment, you'll have the chance to hear from our wonderful panelists on the ways that these resources are used throughout communities all over the state. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time just giving a high level overview of the data sheet while highlighting some of the key findings. And then I'm also going to show you all of the resources that accompany our data sheet, such as our interactive data dashboard and our discussion guides. So before we do that, um, let's talk about how the data sheet is created. So every year we utilize national and state data sets to report on many different barriers to prosperity. And we recognize that so many of these barriers intersect with each other. So we feature all kinds of measures such as rates of poverty, food security, educational attainment, household income, and then new to the data sheet this year is a measure for health insurance coverage. And then within those measures, we highlight some pretty stark disparities across different populations and geographies. So we really want this project to allow people to both zoom in and zoom out. For example, we want you to be able to look at specific counties as well as look at the state as a whole. And so to summarize some of this year's key findings, this year Alabama is the seventh poorest state in the country. According to Census Bureau data, Alabama has more than 747,000 people living below the federal poverty line. And that figure includes 233,000 of Alabama's children. So a tremendous number of people and poverty is definitely more concentrated in some regions of our state. Nine counties in Alabama have a poverty rate higher than 25%, and only one single county in our state has a poverty rate under 10%. So while poverty in Alabama has actually decreased over the last several years, the state's poverty rate is still much higher than the national poverty rate. As you can see on this slide, the national poverty rate is 12.3% compared to Alabama's poverty rate of 15.6%. Additionally, the child poverty rate in the US is 16.8%, 
while the child poverty rate in Alabama is 21.9%. And then another way to look at financial security is to highlight income disparities. So the national median household income is $65,712, while Alabama's median household income is about $14,000 less at $51,771. And so we already mentioned disparities across the counties in our state, and we also see disparities across race and ethnicity. So looking at the three largest racial and ethnic groups in our state, we see that poverty rates across these three groups are very different. So the poverty rate of Hispanic and Latinx Alabamians is 29.9% in that yellow bar, compared to a poverty rate of 27% for Black and African American Alabamians in that purple bar, which is compared to a poverty rate of 11.7% for white Alabamians in that gray bar. So similarly, median household incomes for Black and Hispanic individuals in our state are far lower than the median household income for white Alabamians. And so we point to these disparities because if we only looked at our statewide poverty rate as a whole without further disaggregating it, we would really be missing um, our state's history and legacy of racial injustice so we think breaking down the data as much as possible is imperative to better advocate for closing equity gaps and breaking down barriers to prosperity. So we are going to take a look at our resources. All of these resources can be accessed or downloaded at alabamapossible.org slash data sheet. So I am going to project our data sheet so that we can give you a preview of that. All right, can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to start with the maps which allow us to visualize and compare poverty rates of different geographic regions. So the darker the shading of the county or the state, the higher the poverty rate. So let's look at the map of the United States first in the center of this page. So you can see that Alabama is one of seven states in the country with a poverty rate greater than 15.5%. So this darker orange shading. And to give you an idea, of how poverty is being measured. For a single individual, the federal poverty threshold is $13,011. For a family of four, the poverty threshold is $26,172. So it's probably obvious when you hear this number that this threshold doesn't really give us an accurate depiction of what it takes to support a family of this size. We know that these federal thresholds do not fully capture the scope of hardship that Alabamians face, but what the federal measure allows us to do is make comparisons across states, even if the measure is pretty limited in what it captures. And ultimately, this limitation is why we try to contextualize poverty even further with the measures that we're going to see on the second page of the data sheet. And we'll get to that in just one moment. So it's without question that looking at this map of the United States, that we have a high rate of poverty compared to the rest of the country. But um, actually from the data sheet last year, um, where we were the fifth poorest state, we have changed to the seventh poorest state, like I mentioned. So this indicates relative progress on some level, um, but what I think is really important to know, and Manisha prefaced our conversation with this, 
is that the data sheet actually reflects how Alabama's economy was progressing prior to the pandemic. And before COVID-19, Alabama was seeing the lowest poverty rate that we'd seen since 2008 and the highest median household income yet. Just wanted to make that note. And despite um, the progress that we were seeing before COVID-19, uh, so you can see right here that the poverty rate has been decreasing over the last several years. Despite that, the state's poverty rate is still much higher than the national poverty rate. So there's still room for improving the conditions that Alabamians face. And then if we look more closely at our state by looking at the state map over here, we can see that certain counties are faring worse than others. Like I had mentioned, we see nine counties in Alabama have a poverty rate higher than 25%. Five of those counties even have poverty rates of 30% or higher. So close to one third of the county's residents living below the poverty line. So we see disparities across counties and we can also see these disparities across race and ethnicity in the center bar graph. Again, looking at the three largest racial and ethnic groups in our state, we see the bar graphs um, show that poverty and median household incomes differ quite a lot um, across these three different groups. So if I could give some key takeaways from the first page of our data sheet, as a whole, Alabama definitely saw a decrease in poverty and an increase in median household income. But what we know is that shortly after that progress, hundreds of thousands of Alabamians lost their jobs because of COVID. Um, so we really won't see the story of the pandemic being told until next year's data sheet. And again, we're still seeing huge disparities in poverty rates across counties in our state and across different populations in our state. And so speaking of those different populations, if we go to the second page of the data sheet, then we can see um, data for all 67 counties within the state, as well as the state as a whole, and then the United States. And these measures are broken into big categories at the top starting with poverty rates disaggregated by demographic. So you can look at several different populations here and we think that's especially useful for breaking down the data. In the next section, we see rates of food insecurity as measured by Feeding America and then rates of recipients of SNAP benefits or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Next, we see a bunch of different education measures. This year, we've disaggregated educational attainment by gender. So you can see the percentage of men who are high school graduates or higher compared to the percentage of women who are high school graduates or higher. And that disaggregation is going to be less useful at the national and the state levels, but becomes a little bit more useful at the county level. And so it might be a good measure for county school districts. We also have college enrollment rates, including both two-year and four-year college going rates. As you can see, Alabama has a rate of enrollment in two-year institutions that is much higher than the national rate. And so this continued, um, this really prompts us to continue our investment in two-year community colleges. It's so important. And also um, it prompts us to invest in supporting students who are making the transition from two-year colleges to four-year institutions. Our next big section is employment. And so we are highlighting workforce participation rates of those 16 and older, as well as the median household income. 
And then lastly, our newest measure, we are showing the percentage of individuals who are 19 to 64 years old who are without health insurance. And we show the huge role that employment plays in whether or not people have health insurance. So that's our newest addition to the data sheet. And then if we go to the bottom of our second page, all the way down, you see some key terms defined here. And then we cite all of our sources that were used to compile the data sheet. Please notice the year of each of these data sources. And then to the extent that a two-pager can, we're always trying to include measures that give a fuller picture of barriers that Alabamians face. Um, but um, our interactive dashboard right here will actually dive into the data a little bit deeper. So we recommend this resource, both if you want a more interactive experience and you want to look at data that can't be captured on this two pager right here. So I am going to switch on over to our dashboard. One moment. Okay. So again, all these resources can be accessed at alabamapossible.org slash datasheet. When you go to our 2021 dashboard, you'll be on the first tab, Poverty by State. Here you can click any state on the map. So I'm just going to click New Mexico. It's going to refresh one moment. So I'll click New Mexico and it will show me the overall poverty rate, the child poverty rate, and median household income. So you can select any state on the map. When I go to the second tab, poverty by county, again, here you'll be able to click on any county on the map. So let's click Sumter. And by doing that, I can see the county population, poverty rate, food security, education, employment, and health insurance. So if you are looking at that two page data sheet and you were just a bit overwhelmed by all of the data, what the dashboard allows you to do is actually focus on specific areas of interest. So you can select each county one by one. And then if you would like to make comparisons across counties, you can go to our third tab, the county data table. So here you will have all of the counties, but you can make selections for which ones you would like to see. Just wanna make one quick note. You'll notice here there are some blanks in the table. This is because that population is not represented in that county. So just be aware of that, there might be some blanks. So in order to select the counties of interest, I'm going to deselect all, and then say I wanna look at three or so counties of interest. So I'll have just those on the screen and then I can actually sort by any of the measures by clicking the column heading and then sorting by ascending or descending order. So here we have ascending, I can click it again and choose descending order. And it refreshed again, but taking us back to the home page. The data dashboard can be especially useful for making the data interactive, hopefully also a little bit more palatable and then engaging for things like class assignments. And so speaking of class assignments, we have an educator's guide to discussing and using the data sheet. So I'm gonna move through this resource really quickly 
the purpose of the educator's guide is to incorporate the data sheet and the data dashboard into learning activities in the classroom. And it is primarily meant for secondary and post-secondary age students. So one section of the discussion guide will be in-class discussion questions, which get you thinking about what the data means for ourselves, for our neighbors, for our state as a whole. And I think the discussion questions do a really great job at contextualizing poverty because the questions are going to encourage students to think about factors contributing to financial hardship. And so then after the discussion questions, we have a community assessment worksheet. And this gets students to localize the phenomenon of poverty. And they're gonna do that by looking at the data in their home community. And hey, it gets- uh, may, Excuse me, I'm sorry. Can you, uh, can the screen be enlarged a little bit? Absolutely. Is that better? Yes. One, okay. Awesome. So with this community worksheet, we are getting students to look at data related to their home community, comparing that to the state as a whole. And then it also will get them to consider how these findings are translated into action outside of the classroom. For instance, how would they advocate for policy change based on the data that they've found? And then lastly, we have one um, final little assignment. It's an infographic assignment. This gets students to create a visual representation of poverty for the purpose of strengthening their communication around these issues, ultimately with the goal of them being able to build awareness about poverty issues and advocate for positive change. So that's our educator's guide. And then I'm gonna to move to one final resource. It's our discussion guide. This can be used in pretty much any context, not just the classroom. So with this two page guide, we hope to motivate people to have community discussions where they can describe the data they're seeing, interpret the data based on their real world living conditions, and ultimately critically reflect on what they're seeing. So while there's a lot that we can glean from data, statistics, quantitative analysis, there's so much history and context behind these numbers. So we think having local dialogues that are really driven by community members is a really powerful way to see how these community members are perceiving and understanding the challenges they're facing. So one of our goals with all of these data resources is for people to join together, to brainstorm solutions that feel really localized, and then ultimately to advocate for positive change. And so I'm glad to give you a quick highlight of all the resources. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Manisha to facilitate a conversation with our panelists who are all using these data resources within their communities. Thank you, thank you May for the bird's eye overview of the data sheet. Um, we will now move on to the panel discussion. Our first panelist is Jason, uh, Jason Vandiver who is the Vice President Commercial Banking at PNC and a board member of Alabama Possible. Jason's interest around poverty alleviation and economic empowerment prompted him to participate in the Break It Down series this past summer. So Jason, you have been a board member of Alabama Possible for two years. What are your observations of the Barriers to Prosperity data sheet? Well, uh, pretty multifaceted, if I have to say so. Um, one of the advantages that I have uh, being a banker, I think everybody's heard the the analogy about banker's hours. Uh, I do have some free time that my employer PNC allows me to explore kind of my civic responsibilities. And, and, and one of those civic responsibilities uh, I do through my donation of time to Alabama Possible. So the, the data sheet for me has always been a point of connectivity with people that I'm speaking to in the community. So 
if I'm out uh, seeking to start a relationship with a client and I know that client has a heart for service in some way or another, perhaps they're first generation uh, college graduate or they uh, face their own set of challenges as a young person that you know they had to overcome in order to get to where they are today. It allows me to connect with them on a much deeper level. I can have conversations with them about um, topics that we're both passionate about. And for me, it helps me be a better listener and a better banker. So that, that, that leads you into the, leads into the next question. So how, how do you, um, and it's a twofold question. One is how do you think this data sheet should be used by business leaders across the state? And then if you will share your experience with the Break It Down uh, discussion series, which were guided by the data sheet. Sure. Uh, I think right now, especially as we're in a situation where uh, people are finding it, you know, seemingly a little challenging to hire people right now, employers need to be able to differentiate themselves uh, from perhaps someone down the street offering a similar compensation package. And one way that you can do that is by living a set of philanthropic values uh, and exhibiting those things to your employees and by extension to your customer base. So if, if you are a business owner or a uh, executive at a local uh, business, utilizing the data sheet to target how you're going to spend your philanthropic dollars or spend your philanthropic time is, a, is a, an important thing. Uh, it's an important thing from a uh, employee retention perspective. It's an important thing from a client retention perspective that your clients are seeing that you're giving back to the community. And it just builds a better corporate brand. That's something that I think PNC has done well over the years. And, and I encourage people to use the data sheet for, for those purposes. Um, to the second question, we had a fantastic opportunity to talk to several uh, area leaders back in the fall around the, uh, the data captured in the data sheet. We had civic leaders, we had uh, business leaders, we had nonprofit leaders, we had religious leaders. And the thing that I, I noted from that discussion, the thing that I took away was uh, regardless of what category you found yourself in, there was all a, you know, a shared sense of community around the importance of these topics. For me personally, it's childhood food insecurity. For someone else, maybe it is uh, where Alabama is lingering behind the rest of the country on higher education initiatives. Whatever it might be, uh, that data sheet really is a one-stop shop for anybody that wants to find out, you know, how, how are we doing? You know, what are we going to do to improve our rankings on said sheet? And then how can we possibly collaborate between for-profit, non-profit, religious, and civic lines to get the best return? Thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. And I think uh, what you mentioned about ta targeted philanthropic giving by using um, this data sheet is a big takeaway from um, this conversation. Sure. And I, um, I could see how the collective impact also can be uh, achieved through this data sheet by um, collaborating and uh, having discussions that there's a shared sense of the community in, among the communities. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So George Daniels, our next panelist is an associate professor of journalism and creative media at the University of Alabama. Since 2010, he has taught a service learning course entitled Mass Communication, Service and Diversity. In that role, he has involved undergraduate and graduate students in direct and indi indirect service experiences that engage with residents of all ages in overcoming barriers to prosperity. So George, you have used uh, barriers to prosperity data sheet multiple times with your undergrad uh, students. What was your experience in using the data sheet in the classroom? Well, I just want to build on, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. I want to build on what Jason said, because if Jason's talking in his workplace about philanthropic values and about branding, we are preparing our students to maybe work in places like Jason's working right now. And so one of the things that we are doing in our classes is not just teaching them the, the book skills about whether it's business or book skills about journalism, we're also trying to build those values 
as they're learning about whatever it is they're majoring in. And that's where the service learning comes in. They do a service project while they're learning the core learning outcomes of the class. And at the same time, they're making a difference in the community that's around them. So uh, the 2010 year was the first time that we had an opportunity to take a course that was just on communication and diversity and add the service component. We also, on one of those uh, classes, uh, actually invited in the executive director of what was then the Alabama Poverty Project to come in and talk about these barriers to prosperity. And over the years, as we've had done different kinds of service, whether it would be students tutoring, students at a local elementary school, or students working in a community direct service where they're working with a, a local nonprofit, we introduce them to why they serve by talking about what is the state of affairs in Alabama? And going back to the 2010 data sheet here, or even the 2014 data sheet here, we are introducing the students not only to the problem, but what they can do in solving that problem. Most recently, we partnered with the Alabama Character Council uh, to develop a character education curriculum for elementary school students. And so fourth and fifth graders in Tuscaloosa were learning from the Alabama Barriers to Prosperity data sheet. We were using the brand new data sheet last year, but we were doing it in a virtual environment in the pandemic. So our students went through the Break It Down workshop with Chris McCauley. They also went through a capacity building workshop with Chris McCauley. Then they took that into the classroom and the students at the elementary level took what they learned and did what's called a peanut butter and jelly drive. They collected jars of peanut butter and collected jars of jelly for our West Alabama Food Bank here in the Tuscaloosa Northport area. So it's about using the data as a spark for change. That is, that is awesome, using the data as a spark for change. I'll have to write that down. That is that is really great. So uh, tell me what prompted you to use this data sheet as a tool for your grad students for the first time this semester? Well, the grad students are in my classes learning about how to create knowledge, how to do research. And one of the areas that we focus on is diversity of class. We also talk about how what you do with diversity of class doesn't happen in uh, isolation from diversity of race. And so as May was sharing with us earlier, you have to disaggregate the data. Well, that's an important skill in doing research. And so they can take the data sheet and understand how research can be applied, but also how you can share that in a new story or in developing your own study. And so the grad students have been using the old data sheet. Now we have the new one for the fall 2021 uh, semester. Uh, I have uh, 16 students all over the country in our online degree program who will be engaging with the data here in Alabama. Thank you. Thank you, George. I, um, I also liked how you linked with what you are doing with what Jason was mentioning. So you, you talked about building values um, uh, as they are learning. And I, I think that is a great empathy building exercise too. So as they are get, you know, graduating and going into the workforce, they have this uh, sense of empathy and that helps them not only in like not only in the job that they are doing, but also as uh, as individuals, as human beings. Thank you, thank you. So our next panelist is uh, Pastor Melissa Patrick, who is the director of community ministries at Independent Presbyterian Church in Birmingham. Through her ministry work, she uses her platform to connect diverse po population for community impact. So Melissa, what has been your experience with the Barriers to Prosperity data sheet? Well, I have been using the data sheet since 2010 um, as a faith leader and also a nonprofit leader. Um, at that time, I was at Urban Ministry Incorporated, which is a, a faith-based social service agency in the West End community of Birmingham. And so I wanted to use it for my own self-edification to get to know um, the county and the city a little bit better than I already did. 
Um, it was a, an important evidence-based piece that we used um, to speak into and pivot um, some of our programs. And as we developed more programming around health and wellness um, through the Western Community Gardens, through our social workers who worked with seniors in particular, as well as people who are temporarily unhoused, um, and how this, this, this information um, provided evidence-based um, learning and resources for um, grants as well um, in a nonprofit setting. There are plenty of those to engage with. And then also for board development. Um, you know, Jason mentioned uh, people who have a heart for service. Um, at the time, the board there and other boards that I've been a part of um, are not always racially diverse. Um, that board is now more racially diverse than it was, um, but there were some wonderful white church leaders with big hearts for service and wanted to keep that connection between their faith and putting it into action. And they also wanted to understand better. Um, some of them are from generational wealth and they were engaging with people largely who are in generational poverty and trauma and especially young adults in the West End community who are majority African-American young people who we were all worshiping with and a part of each other's lives. And so the data sheet really helped me in my leadership and engagement with them and also with the community. I think the data sheet is very much an empowerment tool um, as well. Um, it's, a, it's a lot to absorb um, and, and y'all are gifted at helping us break that down so that it doesn't become an overwhelming burden, um, something that's never going to seemingly change, um, but that it's something that can empower us to speak through um, to, to, make, to be change makers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. So how would you recommend other philanthrop philanthropic organizations uh, use this data sheet? Well, I think definitely um, for the evidence, um, for the, the sheer information um, that can um, guide them. Um, here at IPC, um, I use the, the data sheet um, early in my tenure. I've only been here since May. And so the first blog post that I wrote about hunger never taking a summer vacation, I was able to pull some of the key data, especially from here in Jefferson County. Um, we are already really engaged um, in the North Avondale community and the Kingston community, um, which are very different from the majority of the congregation here at IPC, but the congregation is deeply dedicated um, for a really long time um, with important issues, especially related to hunger and food insecurity. And so um, I can speak into that and share that dialogue with them about that. I would encourage nonprofit leaders to dialogue um, with their boards um, and to build that again into their board development um, as a tool for information and um, as a call to action. So as a faith leader, a nonprofit leader, um, it always has to be more than recognizing charity and showing mercy, um, but it also has to at some level be about the systems that are in place and how we can be agents of change um, as we educate ourselves and others about the realities of people who struggle in poverty. You know, I noticed with the educator's guide um, that children, one of the exercises is for children to um, have a, a, a speech, a quick speech, sound bites, as if they were speaking to their mayor or a city official. Um, I would I would say that a lot of um, adult leaders need to have that same um, soundbite, elevator speech, um, the whys, so that we're not all just speaking um, the basis of the data or the, the, the reality of the data, um, but trying to bring that to life. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, you, um, you discussed practical ways um, to use the data sheet. Uh, as a spark for change that George had mentioned earlier. So thank you. Our um, next um, panelist is Chandra Scott, the Executive Director of Alabama Possible. Chandra's passion in creating equitable post-secondary access and success opportunities for all the students of Alabama is exemplary. She believes in shifting mindsets that would result in breaking down generational poverty. 
So Chandra, you have been a board member um, of Alabama Possible and then are now currently, currently the executive director of Alabama Possible. How have you used the data sheet in your former role as a board member and how has that shifted as the executive director? Sure, so first before I answer that question, I want to personally thank Jason, George and Pastor Patrick for such um, amazing comment. I have snagged every one of your phrases um, when talking about this data sheet from being an empowerment tool to being a, a heart, having a heart for service and using this to a spark for change. Um, and really, I, it really ties into my use of it. Um, prior to coming to Alabama Possible as the ED, as a board member and as at the time the strategic officer for another nonprofit, you know, it really allowed me to understand what the needs were on the ground in the counties in which I was working in. At that time, I was really centralized in Mobile County. And, you know, for me, I, I don't believe in having just these kind of high level conversations and data not driving the conversation, um, because at least you have a strong foundation to stand on when you're using data, when you're trying to influence mindset shifting, um, change in policy and or practice. And that's, it's much easier for someone not to be able to argue with you around data. They have to become to come to terms with it and figure out how they're going to begin to, to take on that challenge. And so now shifting into more of a statewide approach, being now the ED for Alabama Possible, I would say the use is no different. Now, instead of only looking at the particular county in which I was working in and, and looking to serve, now is really understanding what's happening across the state knowing how to allocate resources and our supports in the areas that need them the most, it really helps us to make those determining factors. Looking at the data, understanding what's happening across our state, um, really understanding, you know, where, how do we fill those gaps um, where, where we're seeing them, whether it's around um, child poverty, hunger, um, whether it's around post-secondary attainment. Um, some counties have higher attainment than others, but then the hunger for children is different. It's really, really getting to the heart of what the storyline of the data is for us as an organization to know how to um, put forth our um, resources and the supports in which we are hoping to provide um, across the state and to various communities. Thank you, Chandra. Um, and uh, my next question is, how do you think the data sheet could be used by organizations interested in uplifting the resources within and outside of Alabama? This one is, is to me a no brainer and it should be a requirement. Um, if, if you're an or a person that's within an organization or an entity and you're working on change, data again has to drive you. And it's the way for you to really understand what the people in your communities are facing. How do you make decisions on how to put what practices or programs or initiatives that need to be put in place? And even furthermore, how do you know what policies may be impacting this data, whether a policy does or does not exist, um, could sometimes make a shift in what's happening um, in the lives of individuals. You know, it's, it's amazing how sometimes we can realize there are these outdated policies that may be in the way um, that are really giving barriers to people re receiving certain resources and supports they need. This is data is a way to help you look into that. Sometimes there are programs that are within communities that may have just been there a long time but haven't really thought about, do we need to shift where we're serving, who we're serving? The data should be the driver um, for that and helping you to understand, you know, I know a lot of times in the state, we, we forget and, and sometimes programs become entitled programs. Um, and it's sometimes to me, that's unfair because we wanna make sure that we're reaching those who need it the most. It is the only way that we're gonna say we're truly given focus. Um, to break in barriers to prosperity in our state, if we're truly intentional and in being equitable about the resources and supports we as different organizations can provide um, to those across the state. And then I would say um, for those outside the state, you know, it's, it's amazing for me coming into Alabama Possible. I knew a lot of people in the state who used the data sheet. Um, in my office, it was always on the wall behind me. Um, it, it's no different here. But what I didn't realize is the impact that the data sheet has on organizations outside of the state. Um, I will say one organization in particular as an example, when I first came in, um, was an organization, I think they're based out of Boston, they were called Blue Access at the time. And they gave a lot of attention to um, quality of water 
in communities, especially rural communities. And I learned that they use our data sheet to determine where to go in Alabama. And they recognized it was counties within which we know as the Black Belt region, but sometimes people outside of the state don't know those terms, how we you know, um, refer to certain areas in our, in our state. But the data drove them there. Of course, if you would have asked us, we would have told them exactly where they needed to go, right? But being from the outside, they used data to make that decision. And they were able to put resources, um, financial resources, human capital resources into helping to increase the quality of water in rural communities. And so to me, it, that's just another factor about why data is so important. Um, I remember my um, our, our, our old um, organization, our CEO will always say without data, it's an opinion. And, and so we want to shift the narratives from just being an opinionated. I think we have enough of those, especially on social media. And so we want to make sure that we are using data to really drive the work in our state. Um, it is the only way that we're going to really see the changes that we need if we're whether you're talking about post-secondary attainment and helping the governor reach the goal for the statewide attainment goal, whether you're an organization that's working on child poverty, you have to give attention to data um, to being able to make those shifts. Thank you, thank you, Chandra. Thank you so much for sharing how you pivoted from using the data sheet uh, for regional impact to uh, statewide, uh, statewide impact now. And then I, I loved how you mentioned that data should be the driver if you want to leave a positive impact on any community, one should use data to um, be the um, driver. So um, at this point, I would like to thank all our panelists for the informative discussion. I am sure all of us got something out of it, so thank you. And now I will hand it over to Keela Lawrence, the Programs and Communications Coordinator at Alabama Possible. Keela. Thank you. So we are nearing the end of our webinar. And just on behalf of Alabama Possible, I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank you for gifting your time. Our hope is that you will take this information like all of our panelists mentioned and make a change in your community so we can move closer and closer to a prosperous Alabama.